So on a dark night, away from the city lights, you can look into the night sky and see galaxies and stars and planets and maybe the odd satellite, all shining brightly and visible to the naked eye. But beyond the visible light lies a bounty of information. I'm going to tell you about galaxies and how we can understand the beginning and evolution of the universe using radio waves detected by radio telescopes and how Australia has led the way in radio astronomy for over 70 years. The night sky is a beautiful sight. At times you can feel engulfed by the stars of our Milky Way as it stretches across the sky. If you stare deeply at the stream of Milky Way stars, you'll notice not only different coloured stars, but lighter and darker patches. This is our first hint that there is literally more than meets the eye when it comes to galaxies. The darker patches we see are actually regions containing dust, which blocks out the starlight behind. But not only stars and dust, galaxies also contain dark matter, that mysterious ingredient that comprises about 27% of the universe, gases such as hydrogen, and other objects like planets and black holes. So we can only understand galaxies if we understand all of these components. The universe is filled with hundreds and thousands of galaxies. Living in groups and clusters, they interact with each other and transform as they do so. Galaxies are gravitationally bound systems of stars, gas, dust and dark matter and are found in different sizes, from dwarf galaxies with maybe a billion stars, and they're like a hundred times smaller than the Milky Way, to giant spiral and elliptical galaxies that can be more than ten times larger than our own Milky Way galaxy. As galaxies speed through the universe and interact via gravity in groups and clusters, the stars, dust and gas also interact, heating up and cooling, and as they do, they emit radiation in different wavelengths. The process of star formation, stellar deaths and supernovae, black holes and planet formation all emit radiation well beyond the optical regime, and we can detect this with different types of telescopes. High energy processes such as galaxy collisions and black hole accretion disks emit high energy radiation such as ultraviolet light, X-ray and gamma ray emission. We require orbiting or mountainous observatories to detect this radiation as the Earth's atmosphere, thankfully, shields us from this high energy radiation. On the other end of the spectrum, we have radio emission. This is lower energy, long wavelength radiation that can be detected using radio telescopes. Cosmic radio emission has wavelengths ranging from centimetres to sometimes many metres in length. So the telescopes we need look more like an antenna or a satellite dish than a traditional optical telescope. One of the most useful observations we can make in the radio is from the most common element in the universe, the humble hydrogen atom. Hydrogen makes up over 70% of the atomic matter in the universe, is the fuel for stars and galaxies, and has an important feature. It can be detect detected by a radio telescope. The hydrogen atom emits radiation at a wavelength of 21 centimetres, so that's about two-thirds the size of a standard ruler, and it allows us to trace the fuel for future star formation. Radio emission can also be detected from electrons spinning in the magnetic field of jets produced by black holes at the centres of galaxies, from gas surrounding groups and clusters, and from some processes in star formation. These processes are otherwise invisible to our eyes, so radio observations allow us to see more of the universe. Australia has a long history in radio astronomy. Using a World War II radar station in Dover Heights in New South Wales in 1946, the first radio observations were made of the sun, solar flares, nebulas in our Milky Way and extragalactic sources. The CSIRO radio astronomy labs have ensured Australia has stayed at the forefront of radio astronomy ever since that first detection. In 1961, the Parkes Radio Telescope, more recently re um, renamed Murriang, was opened and has a long history of operations since, including delivering images from the famous first walk on the moon in 1969. The Parkes dish is 64 metres in diameter. Radio telescopes need to be very large as radio emission is very faint. Also, radio emission has a much longer wavelength of emission, so in order to get an image with good resolution or one that's not too fuzzy, we need to have very large telescopes like the Parkes Telescope. 
Over its lifetime, the Parkes Radio Telescope has discovered thousands of galaxies and pulsars. It has observed the Milky Way and the nearby galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds, and it's still one of Australia's most important telescopes. During my PhD project, a little while ago, I was a part of a team using the Parkes Radio Telescope to scan the whole sky looking for emissions from hydrogen in galaxies, cataloguing over 5,000 galaxies in the High Pass Survey. Thinking back to our view of the night sky, imagine if our eyes were radio telescopes the size of the Parkes dish. The view we would see would be quite different and include a vast stripe of hydrogen tracing the line of the Milky Way. The Magellanic Clouds are no longer faint galaxies, but they shine brightly in hydrogen emissions, showing they're interacting not only with each other, but with the Milky Way itself. And we see vast tidal tails that stretch across the whole sky. But what if we want an even clearer picture of the radio sky and more sensitive observations? We can make bigger telescopes, however, we're then limited by engineering constraints. The largest fully steerable telescope is in West Virginia. The Green Bank Telescope has a dish diameter of 100 metres. You can build a bigger dish. In China, the Fast Radio Telescope has a diameter of 500 metres. However, the dish itself is built in a valley to support its great weight. It cannot move, so the observing range of the telescope is limited. So to make an even bigger telescope, we need to hook together a number of smaller dishes to act as a larger telescope. So if you travel a little way up north, up the Newell Highway, past the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales, you'll come across the Australia Telescope Compact Array, just outside of Narrabri. This is a six-dish telescope array which was opened in 1988. The six dishes, each 22 metres in size, link together and can be spread across a six kilometre track, providing the same resolution as a telescope with this diameter. This has allowed astron astronomers to map in detail the centres of galaxies, find and explore distant galaxies, map the disks around protoplanets and reveal where hydrogen gas lies in galaxies, allowing us to understand how they are evolving. Similar telescopes have been built around the world. Given the power of telescope arrays for resolving the smallest details, it is this technology that the next generation of radio telescopes is based on. In Western Australia, Australia's newest radio telescopes have begun operations. The Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, ASCAP, and the Murchison Widefield Array, MWA, are located in the Shire of Murchison, a shire with the area around about the size of the Netherlands and a population of a few hundred people. This remote location is far away from the interfering radio signals that are produced by humans, such as mobile phones and satellite TV, and provides a radio quiet night sky. ASCAP is comprised of 36 dishes, each 12 metres in diameter. Its advantage is a new technology that makes scanning the sky more than 10 times quicker than other telescopes. The large number of dishes means that the images we see show not only finer detail, but also allows us to detect fainter galaxies so we can observe more of the universe. ASCAP is about to embark on a survey of the southern sky, similar to the survey Parkes undertook more than 20 years ago. This new Wallaby survey um, aims to detect up to 600,000 galaxies in hydrogen, looking in further and greater detail than ever before. We'll be able to not only look at how the gas content of galaxies differs in different environments, but we can also trace the physics of these interactions and discover how these galaxies have been evolving over time. But the ultimate next step for radio astro astronomers is the Square Kilometre Array, or the SKA telescope, with plans for its construction progressing at a great rate. The SKA will be comprised of two types of telescopes. One for shorter wavelengths, which will be made up of about 3,000 dishes in South Africa, and one for longer wavelengths, which will be made up of hundreds of thousands of antennas in Murchison in Western Australia. The SKA will produce over 600 petabytes of data, or 600,000 terabytes of data per year, which will be analysed and stored by custom-built supercomputers. This is the equivalent to more than a million 500 gigabyte laptops. Some of the science that will be done with the SKA includes understanding how galaxies evolve and what is dark energy. We'll use rapidly rotating neutron stars, known as pulsars, to test Einstein's theories of gravity. We'll try and understand how magnetic fields are generated and what role do they play in the formation of stars and planets. 
we'll observe how the first stars and black holes were formed at the beginning of the universe, and we'll look for signs of extraterrestrial life with observations for complex molecules which are the building blocks of life. And in addition to all of this will be the unexpected discoveries. With a telescope like the SKA that can probe back to the beginning of the universe, who knows what else we're going to find. Thank you. Thank you.